Good morning. morning. I think it is appropriate to have this service at 10 a.m. As Ann and Jim, as long as I've known them, have always been those who've come to an early service. And so it is appropriate that we gather here. Just be glad that it wasn't at 8.15. That was the preference, I believe. Uh, Welcome. My name is Steve Autry. I have the privilege of being the senior pastor here at Denver United Methodist Church. And on behalf of the congregation, welcome. And in the name of Christ, welcome. We gather in his name at this time to celebrate Anne's life. And when you think about it, a funeral is is kind of a strange thing. For what can be said to speak to someone's life in the few moments that we have? The words can be hard to come by. But we're going to do the best that we can with the words that we have this day as we hear from members of the family, as I have a word or two to say. But we also know that we gather not in our own strength, because we could not stand in our own strength at a time such as this. And so we are blessed to have words that the church has provided for us, words that have been used throughout the generations to speak out to us and back to our own selves the truth of who God is, especially at a time such as this. And so hear these words that are given to us in the liturgy of the church of Jesus Christ. Dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, and put on Christ. So in Christ, may she be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. And so it is that we have gathered here as friends and family to Praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate Anne's life. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow hope, in death resurrection. Let us pray. Most gracious and eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. Especially, we praise you for Anne Lorraine Hawk, whom you have graciously received into your presence. To all of these, grant your peace. Let perpetual light shine upon them and help us so to believe where we have not seen that your presence may lead us through our years and bring us at last with them into the joy of your home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Anne was a a lifelong Methodist, baptized into the Christian faith and the Methodist tradition, lived out her life in that tradition, and a part of that tradition is hymn singing. And at this time, we're going to sing our first hymn of the day. It is Blessed Assurance. You can find that on page 369 of your hymnal. Will you please stand as we sing together?
I'd like to invite Emily and Lindy to please come forward for our reading. And for the rest of you, please have a seat. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 through 8. Comfort, O comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. The next reading is from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Our second scripture is from Psalms 139, 7 through 18. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward, inner parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance, in your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Witness is part of the Christian tradition. Sometimes when we hear that word, it can conjure up uh, images of preachers on street corners or evangelists handing out tracts or yelling at people. That is not the way to understand Christian witness. Christian witness is simply saying and telling what you have seen, what you have experienced. Today, we are honored to have members of the family come and share what they saw in Anne's life, uh, what they felt, what they experienced. Jim and Galen will be coming, and uh, whichever order you would like to come, just 
Jim will be first. Uh, and thank you for speaking to your mother's life. So, this past week after mom passed, Steve came over and he said, uh, you know, it'd be nice to have a family member say something. You know, yeah, it would. And my dad turned to me <laughs> and goes, you want to say something? I go, no, I don't really want to because I don't know if I can get through it. But I will. So all week long, I've had this on my mind about what I'm going to say about mom. So Thursday night, I'm out in the porch, my wife, and I had notes. And I was going through my notes, and I thought, well, I can just get away with winging it. And so I was going over it, and the words weren't coming. And just it was all scattered brain. I couldn't put a thought together. So I had to sit down and write it out. So here we go. But after writing this, there's a, a few things that I left out that I need to, I'm going to wing it here at the beginning. One is, is it's an interesting thing that you were saying about mom joining the Methodist church and she was lifelong Methodist. And I go, I wonder if he knows the background story of that one. <laughs> so my mom, parents, and family were Mennonite. And they came from a large, a rather large family. And so she had aunts and uncles that were close to her age. And she had very close relationships with them. And when it became time, I don't know, probably sixth, seventh grade is when they go through whatever they go through to join the church. And her dad insisted that my mom was not old enough and would not allow her to go and join the Mennonite church with her, with her aunts. I believe it was Vilma and Violet. At any rate, so she, would, she wouldn't always go to church with them. I think she went, I'm not sure how the story goes, but she would go to church with another couple, and, I, and I'm not sure, it may have been a Methodist church, may not. But anyway, she, was, she developed a very strong faith, and I remember her telling me this story, and I don't know the specifics of it, but I remember her dad or mom telling her something about God or Jesus or something, and she fired right back in and said, well, that's not what the Bible says. So she knew, and she had a very strong faith. So that's the background of that. The other thing, too, that I didn't really include, but I want to, my dad, the last couple months, and how he took care of my mom. It's a uh, good job, Dad. He, he would tell me, this is not the plan. This is not how it was supposed to go. Well, you know, that's why we play the games, you know. That's why we live life, because it doesn't always go as planned. So plans have changed. And I also want to mention the countless, and I, I, don't, I don't include this, and I don't know why, but my mom and dad went to countless ball games, soccer games, recitals. They were always there. You can attest to that. They were always showing up. And finally, my wife, such a, she was always so good to my mom. And I wanna thank her for that. So that's the winging part of it. Now for the prepared notes. 
There's a sign on the back porch at my parents' house. And if you've been over there, you've probably read it. You probably don't think much of it. But it said, it says, if you're lucky enough to live near the water, you're lucky enough. And she loved living on the lake. But uh, we'll come back to that later. My mom was a wonderful woman, lived an extraordinary life. I only hope my words can express the essence kind of person she was. I want to take uh, this time to apologize to everyone for coming out on a Saturday morning, taking time out of their day. That's not the way mom had planned it. She told her sister when she was ill that she was not invited to the funeral. <laughs> it was going to be just immediate family. And uh, well, too bad, Mom. <laughs> Plans have changed, and if you want to be technical, we're not having a funeral. We're having a celebration of life. We're going to be talked about either way because you're loved and adored by so many. And if you would have told that to her when she was alive and well, you'd say this, and she'd look at you, and what would she do? Go over, that's one of her things she did. Anyway. So, one afternoon we're up at the lake and mom, matter of factly, announced that uh, they spend the day at the funeral home planning for her final arrangements. And I go, well, that's weird, but all right, but that sounds like something my mom would do, very practical, you know. She was like that. Well, it wasn't until months later, and I mean months, and I'm not even sure how long, but it was, I think it was over Christmas, we were sitting there, and it was just my family and dad, and mom sits here and announces she has cancer. So, well, where did that come from? And it's like, all right, well, but not to worry, she's got years left. It is this rare cancer that wasn't really aggressive, and so it was something we just had to deal with. Anyway, my mom grew up, correct me if I'm wrong, is this Chester County where they grew up? Is that where the farm was, Chester County? I don't know, some of these things. Then <laughs> she grew up on a farm, and I don't recall mom ever having fond memories of farm life. <laughs> but she learned some lifelong lessons that served her well. The farm was just up the road from down home. And I never really got why they called it down home, but because it was never down home to me, but her family, my mom's dad's family grew up on that farm. So it was always referred to down home. And they had a large family, 12 siblings. So when mom wasn't doing chores, she had aunts and uncles close to her age that she could play with. It was where they, she developed her love for family. I remember mom decorating the Christmas tree one year and finding an ornament that was a picture of her grandfather, Ammon Stolzfus. I remember her saying she needs to find a good spot and took the ornament and hung it in a prominent place near the top of the tree where everyone could see it. I also assumed that she learned to cook from her mom, Hannah, and she learned how to tend garden, among other things. And she loved, always loved her flowers and garden. And mom had no intentions of living on the farm for the rest of her life. She had a plan. So after high school, she enrolled into nursing school at Lancaster General Hospital. During nursing school, one January, they were out, her and her friend, Janet Fisher, and of all places, she spent, they were, went to have a bite to eat at a bowling alley of all places. They spent, uh, my mom and dad spent a lot of time at the bowling alley over the years. But anyway, they bumped into a fellow by the name of Jim Hawk. So I guess one thing led to another, and well, here we are after an extraordinary 65 plus years love affair. 
Now, before I go any farther, I gotta share this story about my mom and me. Something my kids might finally understand about why I have this odd behavior, or at least they think it's odd. Over the years, I would hear stories about Edith. Edith ran the nursing school that mom attended in Lancaster. And she ruled the nursing school with an iron fist. Strict curfews, uniforms had to be just right, whatever it was, it was very strict. And one of the things they had to be done correctly was folding linens and towels. And after they were folded, they had to be put in the closet with all the folds facing the same way. <laughs> My kids can attest, to this day, that's how I fold towels and linens and place them in the closets. But every time I fold in towels, I'm thinking of mom. After nursing school, my parents got married. They lived in Frank Lancaster briefly until Uncle Sam called. And back in the day, uh, there was a draft at one time in this country. And my dad, many of his brothers had been drafted. So he served two years at uh, Fort McClellan in Aniston, Alabama. And like so many places where they lived, they forged lifelong relationships. Jack and Janet Reyeskov was one of the couples they hung around with. Mom works at the local hospital while Dad plays soldier. This was her first introduction to the South. And little did she know. Anyway. They played a lot of double deck pinochle. I can just imagine the stories and laughter they shared. It was always the girls against the guys. Losers had to contribute a dime to the jar. They eventually used the money to, be, to pay for expenses they incurred at a weekend bowling tournament. Mom was always able to make friends, not just friends, but lifelong friends. Another thing you may or may not know about my mom is that she was a great cook. Not fancy or TV show worthy, but she knew how to put a meal together. I've been spoiled my whole life from women who are great cooks. My mom and wife are both magicians in the kitchen, and where they really shine was during the holidays. Her green beans, mashed potatoes with brown butter, pretzel salad were among her specialties, and we always had pork, sauerkraut, mashed potatoes at New Year's for prosperity. It worked for us. Her all-time best, though, and my family can attest to this, was her beef tenderloin as she served on special occasions. Although she fell short on one meal, I remember in particular in Cincinnati we lived, she would, was out grilling steaks and was serving these steaks, and I noticed she was kind of looking at us funny. And I turned, I go, Mom, these steaks taste funny. You remember this, Brian? You might not have been there, but the, the steaks taste funny. And as it turned out, they weren't steaks at all. It was liver. <laughs> she thought she was so clever and getting one over on us. Anyway, she loved to tell that story, which is another trait that, that my mom had. She was a great storyteller. She also loved to travel and always made friends along the way. She had an uncanny ability to strike up a conversation with anyone and find some common ground, whether it be whether, where they were from, what kind of job they had, you name it. She would come up with something that she had in common or something she could talk to these people with. She never met a stranger, a trait that served her well as a trailing nurse when she came to Charlotte. And as a result, she always had a good story to tell about the people she met. She's visited Europe, Israel, London, Scotland, Canada, Brazil, Australia, Hawaii, Galapagos Islands, China. The one note about China was, I remember this story, it wasn't about some phenomenal place they went to see or visit, but it was apparently Chinese food in China is not like Chinese food in America. And so I remember the highlight of her trip were Snickers bars that she had brought with her and, uh, and a trip to the KFC in China. 
and she never eats at the KFC, but apparently they were enamored with her white hair, and uh, they all wanted to practice their English with the, with the girl with the white hair. My mom has been to the crown of the Statue of Liberty, the Washington Monument, top of the arch in St. Louis, top of Pikes Peak, She'd been to the Baseball Hall of Fame, Football Hall of Fame, Yankee Stadium, City Field, Camden Yard, Fenway Park, and of course, Riverfront Stadium, which we spent many days going to Reds games when I was growing up. And mom, always the practical person she was, she would pack lunch. She would bring hot dogs all the time and have soda or tea or something. And we would have a, we'd have a time, wouldn't we? I got, it was countless times. That, we, we did that. And of course, uh, there are many other venues that uh, they went to. My mom and dad loved to take these baseball bus tours. And of course, along these tours, uh, they always met people and had a story about where they were from. One location has been revisited since the early 70s by my family and friends from Cincinnati. Holds a Special place in the history books. Where is that? Siesta Key. We have now passed this tradition on to my family who will be visiting in two weeks where there will be an empty cabana chair. But a place where we will share stories of love and laughter about mom's life. Uh, this part, I got to wing a little bit because I neglected to put her into this, but uh, she had a dear friend, Ellen, that she had in Charlotte. And Ellen and mom, they were quite the pair, but my mom, she wanted to learn to ski, so her and Ellen, they'd get out on the lake, and sure enough, I don't know how old she was. She was 60s, well in her 60s, and she'd be out the two of them skiing behind the boat. And of course, no discussion about my mom's life would be complete without talking about our time in Cincinnati. A mini series can be made about the friends and good times my family experienced here. <clears throat> and so, Jen Lee Taylor, so when I was coming up, I couldn't find, I didn't know what to say. I couldn't put it into words. But they were quite the pair. My words cannot do justice for the kind of friendship those two had. They could figure out how to do just about anything. They were the YouTubers way beyond YouTube ever came along. They could figure out how to do it. I remember them doing remodeling work all the time. They would always take turns in each other's houses and always had some project going on. Whether it be wallpaper, painting, knocking walls down, you name it, they did it. They have, they had upholstered furniture and there's probably still upholstered furniture in our house that, that mom did, mom and Jen Lee. Yard work too, I remember them getting the load of boulders. Well, not boulders, but they were sizable rocks. They were big rocks. You couldn't just throw them on a wheelchair. He, so mom and Jen Lee had to come up with this whole plan of how they move these rocks around their yard. So they came out with this board and they get two round PVC pipes, two or three, and they would lift this, these rocks on this board somehow. And then you put these PVC pipes and roll it until one come out and keep putting it. <laughs> and so over these two yards, these women move these great big rocks. They were, and they were quite the pair. But anyway, she was a dear, dear friend of my mom. And I'm not sure if there was a specific event or just an accumulation of actions or things that my mom would say or do over the years that earned her the name Hannah Two. Hannah One was my mom's mom, a wonderful woman who led a wonderful life. Both of them were in poor health in their final years. Final years. Hannah had a bad heart and essentially outlived her pacemaker before she finally passed. And so it was with mom. She lasted a lot longer than any of us expected, and as such, we would affectionately refer to as Hannah too. 
And on one occasion, my grandmother was visiting my aunt and uncle, and my cousin Adam was playing when the saints go marching in on the piano. Hannah became enamored with the song and requested Adam to play it whenever she came over and insisted he play it at her funeral. So in honor of the two Hannahs, we'll be singing when the saints go marching in. Now, last Saturday, if you recall, was a beautiful day. And I went over to see Mom. We'd open up the windows in the bedroom. We'd hear the birds. Just a wonderful, wonderful day. It wasn't too hot. But we knew Mom's time was coming to, to an end. It, it wasn't that day, maybe, but soon. She, she could no longer talk and spent most of the day sleeping. Somebody was always by her side. My Aunt Kay and Uncle Willie were there. I want to thank them for all the support they gave my mom and dad over the last year. My Uncle Galen and, sorry Brenda, but we're going to have to call you Aunt B, stopped by. My wife and oldest daughter were there. My dogs were all over the place, afraid they might miss something. We carried on like we did so many times over the years at the lake. Some went swimming, some on the porch talking. When I was watching mom, sometimes she would stir and open her eyes like she had something to say. It's like she could hear us all out and she wanted to be a part of it. We had a, a simple dinner at the table like we had done so many times over the years. And I was sitting on the back porch with my aunt and uncle and about 10.30 I decided, well, it's time to go home. I went in to tell my dad I was leaving. He was laying with mom on the bed, had the Braves game on, which by the way, they won in extra innings. I said, I'll be back tomorrow and walked out the door as I had done so many times before. About 12.30, my dad called and said, mom was finally called home. And after another, after another wonderful day at the lake, so to sum it up, faith, friends, family, good times and good food, a life well lived. And so if you were lucky enough to know and love Ann Hawk, you're lucky enough. was pretty good. I got here without stumbling and made it up those two steps. I can't uh, do this without notes. So I have to uh, appeal to my notes. And what is this? A dozen eggs to, to pound a cork. I got the wrong stuff. So I have to wing it after all, I am in the presence of my earth sister, whom I have always loved. And she is here, and I, I have known her for more years than I like to say. She is nine years older than me, if my arithmetic is right. And don't believe half that she says about me. I didn't do half of that stuff. But I had another sister that I met, I think, in 1957. And I've known Anne, or I did know Anne, for 65 years. I was quite attached to Anne and her entire family. I played soccer with her brother. And I knew her mother and father. And I used to sell ice cream to her mother. And I knew the entire family. Um, Anne grew up in southern, southeastern Pennsylvania. Her maiden name was Stolzfus. Now, for our friends who have never heard that name, be assured, 
It's not strange where I came from. Stolzfus. Stolzfus is the same as Smith up there. And Anne was born and raised on a farm, and she was um, surrounded by little towns. And I don't know if there are enough people past 60 to understand what Mayberry was. Mayberry, North Carolina, was uh, Andy Griffin's town. Well, that's the kind of community that, that Anne grew up in. Uh, there were six or seven of them at, at one time. And she, she, had, she had the Mayberry attitude toward life. And right now she would be saying, stop it and uh, mo move on, wouldn't she? And she met my brother. She told me one time, I'm glad that I met your brother and married him because how could I go anywhere and spell Stolzfus to every, cler to every clerk I ever met? And uh, she avoided that by, she said, that's one reason I married your brother. And I don't remember her mentioning any other, but uh, <laughs> that, 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 that might have been it. Um, how, do you, how do you sum up 84 years and 20 days in 84 seconds? Very difficult task quite beyond me, and I can't do it, and I don't think anybody can do it. But she lived a righteous life. She was the best mother and the best grandmother and the best aunt, uncle, and whatever uh, title you want to give her. And she loved everybody unconditionally, all her, her grandchildren were her children, and all her children were her children as well. She was the perfect mother and the perfect friend and the perfect sister. And she lived the Christian and righteous life because I saw that she did. She loved everyone, including her daughters-in-law, which sometime, sometimes is, is, is more or less, and, and she always spoke of her daughters-in-law as her, her daughters as well. Uh, this is a perfectly serviceable Saturday, and Anne would be trying to shoo us away and say, go, 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 and go shopping or do something more productive than, than glorifying her life that, that she kept uh, quite private. And I loved her so much, and she was, uh, she was, uh, a great part of my life, especially as I got older. Can, any, can anybody think that she wasn't a perfect picture of everything? Sometime in the future, perhaps the pastor will invite me to the sermon which teaches me about Anne's last two years of life. Why she had to be submitted to that distressing period of time. I would like to hear the explanation for that in Jesus and God's terms without the use of the word magic or mystery. Anne left us on Sunday, June 
9th at 12.10, June 10th. Is it 10th? What was it? Was it the 5th? Why did I say that? June the 5th at, at 12, at 12.10 a.m. Those believers among us know that God replaced her. We just don't know where. Thank you for sharing from a perspective that nobody else could have your interaction, your story that is deeply intertwined with that of Ann Hawk. As I was reading the obituary earlier this week when we first got a copy of it, for one, there are a couple words I didn't understand. I'll just be straight up honest about that. But what struck me in that is this line in there where it talks about, um, about Jim and Ann's life together. And, and here, I'll just read it. The phrase in-law and the prefix grand had no meaning whatever to our Ann since she regarded Jimmy's wife Beth and Brian's wife Carol as daughters and their children Julianne, Lindy, Emily, and Wesley as her own. There's something holy about that. It's holy because our God is a God who desires to have a family, who desires relationship. And it's not just for the sake of those who find themselves in relationship or for the sake of those who find themselves being a part of that family. God's desire to be connected is God's way of reaching out and blessing the world. That's the call to Abram, a call that asks him to come and, and become a people. And if you remember in the book of Genesis, God says to Abram, I will be your God, you will be my people, and your family will be a blessing to all the world. See, God creates family. God makes family happen, and it doesn't only happen along the lines of biology, as you have attested to. And so I just want to read this passage that struck me about that. This is from the book of Ruth, chapter 1. By the way, I knew Ann first when I didn't have to wear these to read. But ten years ago was when I first met Ann Hogg. And I didn't have to wear these. Actually, I have a pair of yours on my desk, Jim, that you gave me after a service not too terribly long ago when I struggled to read the Scripture. And you said, here, take these. I think you need them. I don't know if you remember that, but they're on my desk, by the way. If you need them back, I've got my own now. So here we go. Ruth chapter 1. This is the story of tragedy, of hurt, of loss. I, I don't know how it... It answers any of those questions you have, Galen. That, that would be a longer sermon for a longer day. And I um, believe you're an attorney, correct? You've already countered the argument of mystery, right, that we pastors hide behind. I, I don't understand either pain, hurt, and suffering. But yet, somehow, some way, God manages to still wring blessing and hope even out of despair. At least that is our hope. And so this is the story of this lady named Naomi who had a husband, had two sons, had two daughter-in-laws. Her, her husband and her sons die, and she's left with two daughter-in-laws. And she tells them, and they are um, not of the same race. They're not of the same genetic line. That's neither here nor there for us, I hope but it was a big deal back in their time. And she says, go home to your people. One goes home to her people, but the one named Ruth said, do not press me to leave you 
or to run back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. It's a story about the bond of love, about determination and perseverance, and even in the face of, of hard times. For those hard times do come. It's not a question of if they'll come. They, they do come upon everybody. The question is, how will you persevere through them? How will you stay connected? How will you hold on? And Jim, I am grateful for the lessons you've taught me over the last two years of what it looks like to hang on to someone that you love in words that are, are indescribable. I, I rarely ever saw uh, Jim and Ann apart. That love, that bond, that, that, that persisted, the commitment to live out those wedding vows made all those years ago, uh, to love, to cherish, the for better, the for worse, to hang in there. And so in this story, we see what God does. If you follow and read the rest of the story, it's not a terribly long book. You can read it in just a few chapters. What happens from here? is the persistence of these two women, the, the love they have for each other, the, the, eventual, the eventuality that Ruth will remarry, will have her own child, who then have, will have other children that will lead eventually to David, the very king of Israel, which will eventually be the genealogy which Matthew calls upon for the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It is God seeking to be a blessing. And those blessings back to the world begin in the midst of relationship, of connection, of understanding that we're not alone and we're not called to be alone. And we're not called to be alone just for our own sake, but also for the sake of others, to be a blessing back to the world. Jim, you and Ann have been a blessing to me over the last decade of my ministry and my relationship with you and your family. The, the getting to know you all a little bit better, whether that be sitting in a hospital room and, and sharing stories. Um, I hope Ann gets a, a chance to see Miss Edith up there in heaven, but the way she discussed her, I'm not so sure. Uh, of course, that's beyond my pay grade, and God's love and redemption is for all. Getting to hear the the stories of times at the lake and the ball fields, the, the travel. You all have been constituted by the love and grace of God to be a blessing back out into the world. That, that's what we're called to do. That's who we're called to be. And it starts with relationship. Relationship that makes us family to each other. Relationship that drives God's goodness back out into the heart of creation. And by the way, that creation, it desperately needs that. To share goodness and hope, not hurt and harm. To lift up the good word, not to be fixated on the bad word. One thing that occurred to me and this is me winging it now, by the way, Jim. <laughs> uh, those of you who have ever heard me preach know that's pretty much how it goes, and you just hang on until David starts playing and runs me out. Something occurred to me in your conversation that connects back to this text. These women had to move from one place to another, to another, to another. Love travels, doesn't it? Love travels, whether it's from a small farm in Mennonite community to Cincinnati to Lake Norman. Love travels. Love travels, evidently, even to China. Love travels. Love is not 
relegated to just one place at one time. It's something that is called to be taken with us wherever we go. What we believe and what we hope in our faith is that love travels beyond what we can see or know. That love travels from this life into the next. And that the reality of who, of who Anne is and who she continues to be, yeah, it, it, it's traveled. It's maybe the, the greatest trip of all time to a new existence, a new way of being in relationship with her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. She's traveled to a, to a place that we do not know yet, that we pray someday we will know. But it travels because of what God does for us, in us, through the person of Jesus Christ. I am grateful that the love that Ann Hawk carried with her, shaped by her faith, traveled to be part of my life, to make me a better person, to help shape and form me. That's who she was, and that's who she remains to be. And so we do not stand here as those who have no hope. We stand here as those who proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the goodness of God, and the ongoing reality of life that overcomes death through the strength of Christ. And that, I pray, that's enough for this day and every day that is ahead. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Will you please stand as we sing once again. This time our hymn is, It Is Well With My Soul. It's number 377 in your hymnal.
family will receive friends uh, immediately following this service in our old fellowship hall, otherwise known as the Cork, for those of you who are familiar with our campus. It is the stand-alone building on the south side of the parking lot, and the family will be going there immediately following this benediction. May the strength of God Almighty, may the hope of the Holy Spirit, and may the redeeming work of of Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection be real to you this day. And may we all be reminded of God's great love for us, God's insistence on having a family and making us part of that family. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>